there question, questions from the uh, audience? Yes, sir. Yeah, Pascal Fuchsuber from Walnut Creek. Tremendous uh, presentation, and again, I want to thank uh, all the speakers, and particularly Horatio Asman, uh, who I witnessed doing his first uh, laparoscopic Whipple procedure many, many years ago in Walnut Creek, and I stayed, and he left. I find it fascinating. I'm doing open procedures. How much we as open surgeons have learned from what um, is done on a laparoscopic field. And now you're telling us that the advantage might be in the wound and the lymph nodes. So why not cut the difficulty and do part of the, do a hybrid procedure where, for example, that 45 minutes an hour that you do trying to do the, your pancreatic anastomosis laparoscopically, why not make a five centimeter incision or maybe six and try to do it sort of hybrid open? That's my question. Have you ever tried that? Has anybody ever tried that? Uh, two comments about it. One is that um, the way I learned to do this is I, I did an, an HPV open fellowship. I was proud to say maximally invasive surgery. Uh, how I learned to do this, Dr. Bobby alluded to a bit earlier, but with my patients, I told them when I started, I will do your uh, resection laparoscopically and your, and your uh, re reconstruction open. That was my, I thought was the Achilles heel. I learned a lot, and you're exactly right, actually. The small incision is, is much better tolerable. There is a big difference. If you remember when lap coli was introduced, right around the same time, mini coli cystectomy was discussed and was uh, uh, equally advantageous, actually. Patients were able to have ambulatory surgery or go home the next day, have very similar pain scores, et cetera. So I think you're right on the money that uh, uh, there are some procedures that if we can't get the time down to a reasonable level, uh, we should consider uh, a small incision uh, you know, relative, but we have to carefully make sure that benefits are still there in terms of if we have, if we have hernias, if we have wound infections, uh, you know, we've got, we've got some problems. And uh, it, I think there are two ways to look at it. One is in the learning phase, and, and I, I found that very useful. And I, I did find patients certainly had less pain, but I had some wound infections. I had some other issues uh, as well. So uh, personally, I think a, a complete laparoscopic approach is is, is best, but you are exactly right. We must uh, figure out more efficient ways to do this uh, faster. And 45 minutes for a, a, a Peng J is, is, too, is too long, and that's how long it takes me also, so. No, and, uh, I'm in full agreement. I think we don't know yet what are we gonna be end doing it in five years. It may be a combination, or we may cut some time, but I think that the, the 45 minutes we, we may be able to accept if we turn down the time, if we're able to take the time down in other aspects of the procedure. And as I said, the hepatic ginostomy that doesn't take as long. It's, it's just the silly things that, that stop you laparoscopically. You have a very bulky duodenum pancreatic head, and you're trying to move it, positioning, and that's the frustrating part. But we have Mike Hendrick that is doing the cases in five hours, uh, five to seven hours. Then we haven't concentrated in decreasing the time until recently, and we're going to try to do so now. Maybe, could I ask a quick question? So. As an open pancreatic surgeon, you, you mentioned this a little bit. What, what can you tell us, open pancreatic surgeons, that you've learned in laparoscopic Whipples that we could, we could take away from this and uh, apply to open surgery? Um, just, just for clarification, I think that's very important that we don't make, and in this we may disagree, a difference between we're open pancreatic surgeon and you guys are laparoscopic. There's no such a thing as a laparoscopic pancreatic surgeon. A laparoscopic pancreatic surgeon should have done plenty of open pancreatic surgery, should have received formal pancreatic training, because the fact that you have a robot or the fact that you are a really good laparoscopist should not be enough for you to start doing pancreatic surgery. Um, then we need to make sure that we're talking about that. Now, the things that we have exported, the radial dissection of the posterior head of the pancreas, it's incredibly better laparoscopically. And I know it's difficult for, for the people that have not seen it, to think that is that different, but it is different. I have done hundreds of open cases before I did laparoscopic cases, and it is different. Then can we do it as good open? That part we may not be able to do as good open, but at least we can try. The second thing is the identification of the duct um, individually. Now you can do that, we, we do that open. Things like doing the hepatic jejunostomy first, you can do that. The anastomosis, I'm not sure I can do, and this is gonna sound silly, but I don't, I'm not sure I can do as good of a pancreatic jejunostomy open as I do it laparoscopically. 
because I don't have the magnification or the, 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 the stabilization that I have laparoscopically. I do believe my laparoscopic anastomosis ends being better the majority of the times than the open one. Yeah, Dave, I, I, th we've direct, uh, exported directly from laparoscopy to open uh, in a number of things, and it is, it's personally informed my open uh, uh, operation. Number one, SMA first approach. That, I think, was really well described by a Japanese group as the hanging maneuver of the pancreas. But that, I'm able to do a more radical, more appropriate SMA first approach. So, so explain what that and, means. And so what we're doing is we're unhooking the uncinate and the posterior attachments from the SMA first, and then the lateral side of the SMV, the bowels divided, and you rotate like a C, a cup, up, and all you're left with then is the, the last thing hanging is the neck of the pancreas. What that does in terms of the uh, distraction of the cut edge of the duodenum and the other edge of the bowel in a long line is gets you working underneath directly in the right plane. Now, the number one positive margin in RTOG 9704 was the SMA margin and continues to be. So now is that uh, pathology or biology or is it uh, surgery? Well, uh, surgical approaches, uh, I think, similar to mesorectal excision, have impacted that. And that's, that's, that's definitely changed how I do it open. And I'm going to add to that uh, a, a very short part. Is I have learned laparoscopically that the uncinate processes are very different from each other. Um, you have a wedge of uncinate process, I would say 20 to 40 percent of the time, that extends behind the posterior, uh, I mean, posterior to the supramesenteric artery or in between the supramesenteric vein and artery. And you can really chase that laparoscopically better. Question? Good oh, afternoon. sorry, I couldn't even see back there. Uh, yeah, I'm wearing black. <laughs> My name is Sharona Ross. I'm from Tampa, Florida, and um, really would like to congratulate all of you for doing this uh, laparoscopically. As a, I see myself as a laparoscopic HPB surgeon. I know that it's very difficult to develop the skill to do this operation completely uh, laparoscopically. So from in when it comes to the operative time and the learning curve, did you think about, because um, it is difficult to do the whole reconstruction laparoscopically, although you feel at this point, once you develop the skill, that it's easier than op open, but adding a combined laparoscopic robotic, and I know there's a lot of aha about robotics, but for that part of the oper operation of dissecting the, the tumor from the SMV, portal vein and SMV, as well as the reconstruction when you have a very small uh, duct, uh, seeing everything in three dimension, and it, it takes less of training for the surgeon, even a laparoscopic surgeon, to do it robotically than to do it laparoscopically. Uh, did you consider or have you done any combined operations, lapar laparoscopic robotic, for uh, Whipple? Well, the, the, the Pittsburgh group has had a lot of experience with it, and uh, I think overall the robot uh, in many areas of surgery, not, uh, even outside of general surgery, has been a facilitator for folks who don't have that middle ground of, of, of skills. Having said that, I, I think that it's, for this particular operation, it's very important that you have a broad range of uh, advanced laparoscopic skills, uh, that you are that you can suture well, uh, and that you're, you're very accomplished at that uh, before you, you, you entertain this. The robot is a facilitator for, uh, certainly for uh, the reconstruction, but the trouble here is the resection. And if you get into trouble, you'll get into huge trouble. So as Dr. Uh, as been is pointing out, it's those exposure maneuvers that are critical and learning to, this is something that, that many of you, many you might, might not have experienced, but we both have, is massive hemorrhage laparoscopically. And it does not mean you have to open, necessarily. You, you should be able to fix it just the same way uh, you do uh, uh, in, in an open manner. I can tell you the first two times I had it, I did open. But you have to develop those skills to suture and to get vascular control. Uh, a distal pancreatectomy, if you put a hole in the splenic vein laparoscopically, it's amazingly easy to just put two instruments and press up and, and, and collapse a, lo a low pressure system. But then suddenly you've got to be able to figure out a way to work with one hand and suture well. And the tricks that we teach in our courses about the creation of unique sutures uh, that can be used at uh, a, a fisherman's uh, a fly, fly fishing knot, those sorts of things. Lots of techniques you can use, but you've got to be able to do those things. Now, the robot is a facilitator and I think will help many folks, but I don't think it's a substitute for uh, developing a lot of those other uh, uh, techniques. And, and I, I guess I, I'm going to use my surgical oncology hat and say the key to pancreatic surgery is multidisciplinary evaluation of patients yep. and deciding when to use chemotherapy, radiation preoperatively, and patient selection. And, and the technique is important, but that's what really matters. Next. 
Uh, Perez Shaw from New York. Uh, great presentation panel, guys. Uh, we've talked about this for years now and are still uh, working on it as well. Uh, I want to go away from the technical just a little bit. Um, and actually, David preempted my question, which is the role of the MIS approach in the context of neoadjuvant chemo and neoadjuvant chemo radiation and what your experience has been with respect to how that affects resectability laparoscopically. I'll, I'll admit our own editorial. So we've now got about 100 laparoscopic pancreatic resections uh, with about 65 Whipples. Uh, and we've now gone on to do even portal vein resection and reconstruction laparoscopically. And it's an order of magnitude more difficult to do. But we've found, at least in our experience, that the neoadjuvant uh, chemoradiation definitely makes that resection laparoscopically more challenging. Uh, and especially that radial posterior duodenal dissection. And I agree with you, Horacio, that's a huge difference that we've seen with laparoscopy, but that part does get harder. Has that been your experience as well? Yeah, I, my personal experience is that vascular resection laparoscopically, for instance, is not uh, warranted by most of us. I think there's a great value in some of the, uh, the superstar astronauts in our world to, to push that envelope. But in terms of, of the routine use of of this procedure, you will encounter 15 to 30 percent of patients uh, who have neoadjuvant therapy and they've had a reason for it. So those patients are more difficult for the vascular reasons that made them borderline resectable to start with. So not, but if you do your timing correctly, operate within six weeks uh, uh, after radiation and not longer, uh, the, the use of metal stents. And the other caveats that we learned in the open era, I've noticed no difference actually other than the, the vascular issues, which are the reason that those patients had an operation for in the first place. So uh, most of those patients who were borderline resectable, they had abutment of 180 degree circumference of, of a vein and not an artery, right? The, the, the uh, real life, real time uh, changes that neoadjuvant therapy causes in those patients, it's minuscule. It is, it is minuscule. The tumor can become smaller. There's some good resistance criteria, but it doesn't make our job any easier. So if, that's a vas if there's a vascular issue, I'm doing that operation open essentially, and I don't see any, uh, any advantage to the lab. It's, it, we still have to prove that laparoscopy is not the same, but better in some areas. But to work in a very difficult area, right, and try to prove that we're even the same, I think would be, we're not done proving, you know, in more routine cases, but it's better. So I, that's, that's my approach. Um, our approach is we don't make a difference, it's similar, we don't make a difference if the patient has received neoadjuvant or not. If there's involvement of the portal vein and we think there's going to need for clamping of the portal vein, then we do it open. Um, we still do, I would say, around 40% of our cases open mainly because of OR availability and patient preferences that come from out of town and they want to have it done sooner rather than later. But in terms of the vascular, again, we have, um, we have a significant number of lateral resections, and we have done a couple, uh, probably two or three complete resections with cross clamping. The problem is it takes longer, and I don't find any justification to have the liver with less vascular supply for that long. I don't know if I can answer the robot, that, the robot question very briefly um, that was being asked before about the robot. I think that it's a great idea to do the robot if you want to do the robot. However, there are two things that I will be very, very cautious about. One is we have seen this tendency. A lot of people have pressure to use the robot in their hospital. And now because they have a robot, they think, okay, now I can do a pancreatic or do a denectomy. I would warn that today you should not do a pancreatic or start a program of pancreatic or do a denectomy without doing what we have done with everything else. You need to go and look centers now. It's not like before. Now there are people that are doing in serious numbers. Go and learn how to do it before you start. And the second thing is what Craig was saying. Be careful not to become like what has happened with the urologist, that your skills stop developing because once you do it with the robot, you feel comfortable. You don't push yourself further. But I'm not against robotic. I think everybody has to do it as long as that's it. Well, and let's, let's learn from our colleagues, right? The, uh, uh, multi-center long-term trial that concluded last year a five-year analysis of patients with prostate cancer who had open surgery versus robotic and patients who had robotic surgery in a very, very uh, well-controlled study had worse outcomes in terms of nerve preservation. They had worse outcomes in terms of continence uh, and about the same outcomes uh, or a little worse in terms of uh, cancer. So the, the, we have to be very careful about the pressure that we are uh, given to ourselves and by companies to do those things. The robot took over in, in urology, and it is it is no better, and it might be worse still all these years later. So we got to be very careful about that. 
one? Can I just, as a follow-up uh, question, if no one else, I'm sorry. Uh, on editorial on the robot, uh, the one caveat with robotic pancreas uh, that I would caution is that unlike the prostate, with the pancreatectomy, the person at the robot isn't the only important person. And the person that's assisting, who is driving the stapler, who is putting instruments next to the portal vein and next to the SMA, is frankly just as, if not more, critical. And so you really need two very skilled people simultaneously when you're doing it robotically, because you can't just rely on the robot for it. Um, the last follow-up question I had, Craig, is actually with respect to what you started off with. We've established resectional equivalency. What we have yet to establish is oncologic equivalency for laparoscopic pancreatic duodenectomy. Our data has reflected yours uh, and has, has been published as well, which is saying that their time to onset of adjuvant therapy is better and that a higher percentage get to adjuvant therapy. But if we go back to the core of the biology of the disease, uh, if what we're treating is ductal adenocarcinoma of the pancreas, uh, is even that time to adjuvant therapy really going to make a difference in the long term? I don't think we have the data yet. We're certainly tracking it as well, but I'd love your opinions because at the end of the day, for pancreatic cancer, we can argue that it's an exercise in therapeutic nihilism, but is it the biology at the end that's still going to win? And that's the same point that Dr. Mabi made. I think it's yeah. a very good one, that this is simply a piece of the therapy. And my initial comments were that instead of reporting perioperative uh, data only, we must do what is being done in a contemporary way uh, in the open area of, of surgical oncology, which is to look at the surgery and its impact uh, over the other therapies and look at the big outcomes that really matter. And there has not been proven a, a benefit in survival yet. And so we, we've got to prove something big and something that we, uh, demonstrable that matters to patients. Uh, otherwise, you know, people aren't going to pay for this. It's not worth doing, I don't think. Last, last quick question. Chet Hamill from Portland, Oregon. Uh, thanks to the presenters for excellent presentations. Um, in your guys' experience, what would you say is the number of procedures need to be performed to get over the learning curve? Wow. Uh, you know, that's a, such a controversial question. Uh, you know, if you, if you Doug Evans... And this being uh, recorded. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Doug Evans reported uh, uh, just a couple years ago at the Pancreas Club. He and three other attendings just finished their fellowship, and uh, about seven years later, they reported their data regarding blood loss, uh, and, and other important variables. And they all improved right at about 200 cases or so. There's a big inflection point there. 200 cases for an attending surgeon. There's a big difference in all their outcomes. So this is very controversial, actually. Um, I, do, I think that volume really matters. Um, and before I did uh, a laparoscopic Whipple, I'd done almost 800 open. And I don't think I would have been doing it when I did 700. I mean, it really takes a significant experience to be able to take this on and, and, and to do it well. Uh, and I think that that's the problem with robotics, is that uh, the number of cases that I, I'm con I can personally tell you about, about deaths where the first robotic Whipple was attempted and the patient died from bleeding during the operation. Uh, we can't have that happen. Uh, so it's a very, not everybody should be doing this. and. Uh, we really have to ask ourselves, uh, when it is done, people like Dr. Kendrick, it's really important for us to push the envelope. So some of us need to do that to push science forward, but also to ask ourselves the questions, is this good or not? You've got to have a big volume of open HPV surgery before you ever do a liver or you do uh, a pancreatic resection uh, laparoscopically. And we have the responsibility, the group that took this early on and did it and are convinced that in some areas may be better and we're trying to prove it, we have the responsibility to help teach those that are committed and really put the effort to do it. And I think that that, that is very important to remember. Then the number of cases, I don't think that's so much important. I think I've, I've done very complex cases in many different areas of the body. Um, I do now just liver and pancreas, but there has been no case as, that, as the pancreatoidonectomy that has taken me so many and I'm still improving every time. Then, uh, but what you could do is you can start laparoscopically and convert it to open early. Just put at the clock, say, okay, I'm gonna do the mobilization, I'm gonna reach there, but before you do that, take it seriously. It doesn't matter if you do it robotically or open. Ask yourself, do I want to do this? Am I committed to put the effort in it? And if it is, then go ahead and do it, but do it in the right way. And, and look for examples of people who are quite conservative. Uh, Dave, when did you think you became uh, an expert at Whipple? How many cases? Probably a, a thousand. Right. So th th talk to someone who's a conservative position, who people respect, who has a lot of experience. Uh, you're going to hear an answer like that. And it's, it's, not, it's definitely not 200. And so that, that limits the number of people who can do this to a very, very small group of people. 
when that once we can, if we, if we demonstrate uh, superiority in some areas, uh, then we can move forward. But this, uh, I still believe this is a very, very early area that we get bigger fish to fry in terms of pancreas cancer. Well, I'm going to cease the session now and switch over, switch organs in the same part of the body and uh, 